used to being on this side of the camera. <laughs> it was funny, I, uh, we met um, at the church and Sparkle was on our committee. So I remember when Sparkle, the mm -hmm. woman at the end of the table said, yeah. you know, well, I had a video done of me. Yvette's the one who did the interview. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I was yeah. like, you're already famous. I already know, <laughs> I already know about you. <laughs> I already know. Um, I got me out around, what's today, the 27th? The 27th. Yes. yes. Finals day. What day? Finals day for me. Finals? Yeah. So you've already taken them? Oh, no, no. This today's number one. First day. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mr. Fett. Uh, oh, so I'm going to wait till the end. So. Mm -hmm. We'll draw that in. Okay. So, good evening. Thank Is you. It it's on. Oh, okay. So, we're going to start over yet? Okay. Good evening, Yvette Jackson. Thank you for allowing us into your home here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm Dr. Rationese Candy Tate with the Association for the Study of African American and Life and History, the Atlanta branch. And I'm here with Robert Pinnell of Atlanta Metropolitan State College and Asala as well. And Asala. And we're here to tonight, June 25th, 2015. I said June. It is July 25th. 27th. When does it start? I, I wonder, <laughs> why can I never get uh, and I got it right here. Oh, right. That's why I asked what date it was. Good evening, Yvette Jackson. Thank you for allowing us into your home here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm Dr. Rationese Candy Tate with the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, Atlanta Organizing Branch. And I'm here with... Robert Pinnell of Atlanta Metropolitan State College and also a solid. And tonight is June, July 25th. Seven. July 27th, 2015. I can look at the five. The right I'm getting this late. <laughs> But oh, in any case, it's July 27, 2015. Thank you again for letting us into your home. And You're I'm going to let uh, Robert start off the interviews. Okay. Yeah. Uh, where and when were you born? I was born in Dayton, Ohio, August 11, 1968. Um, who are your parents? Or who are your parents? And what were the occupations? Um, my parents are Lawrence and Anita Jackson, and my dad is self-employed. He did work at Dayton Tire and Rubber, then he was laid off, and then he decided to start his own business. He already had it part-time, but then he decided to do it full-time. So he's always been an entrepreneur for the majority of my life. And then my mom was a secretary in different companies. What business did your uh, father start? He started a home remodeling and repair business, so he knows how to fix any and everything. He's the man. Um. Were either of your parents uh, involved in the military? Yes, my father was in the Army, so he was in the Vietnam War, and that's when he got out to marry my mother. So he was drafted, and he did, I think he said, two years, and then they let him out, and he married my mom. Has he ever told you any stories about his experiences in the military? No, my dad was very secretive. Not really secretive, but he didn't really talk about that experience. So when I... Um, produced and directed a film in 2011 about African-American women in the military. Then he told me a bit more about his experiences. And it was basically about Vietnam. And he was a jokester, so he just told me about all the trouble he got into when he stole a vehicle and went to the next camp and they weren't supposed to. So he told me those kind of stories. But my father is very, very fun, very playful. So he really doesn't deal on negatives. So he never told me anything negative or bad. It was just always the, um, the fun that he had. Um, was he an influence in you joining the military? Actually, he wasn't because I really didn't realize he was in the military when I joined. I mean, I saw a picture of him in a military uniform, but it really never clicked that he served. I guess only because he did two years. He wasn't a career military person. So I didn't grow up with a military lifestyle like a lot of people do who grew up who are military career military people. So I didn't do that. So when I joined and I told him, that's when I really became aware that he was in the military as well. Uh, who are your siblings? I have a sister. Her name is Anissa, maiden name Jackson, but now she's Taylor. Um, is she, has she ever served in the military? No, I wanted her to join the Air Force, but at the time she didn't pass the test, so she got discouraged and never went in. And I told her to keep taking it, but she got discouraged, so no, she didn't. I was the only one. Uh, what were you doing before you entered the service? Well, I was 17, so I was in high school. 
So I signed up at 17 and I left for basic training um, two months after I turned 18. So actually just prior to that, I worked at McDonald's and Stump's grocery store after high school in the summer before I left for basic training, which was that November. So I signed up in June and I left for basic training in November. Uh, was there a reason uh, why you wanted to sign up so early? Um, you know, so military was not a part of my career plan. I've always had my life plan since I was in grade school. I knew what high school I was going to was a business school. I knew I was going to major in cosmetology. But the military was not in my plans. I was watching TV one day and a military commercial came on and it was talking about um, paying for school, um, providing housing and food and those type of things. And I was like, hmm, sounds like a good idea. So just one day, I'm very spontaneous, I always have been. One day I just went, got up and went to the recruiter's office. I didn't even know which service I wanted to join. I just went in the very first one. Thank God it was the Air Force and the rest is history. Uh, so you're happy with the decision you made? Mm, doing most that definitely. Course? Changed my life in ways I cannot even really fathom sometimes because I was very shy, very quiet. I was an um, introvert and the, the military brought all of that out of me because you have to speak. They train you to be leaders. So you have to speak, you have to talk, you have to make presentations, you have to lead people. So I learned how to be confident in my voice and who I was as a person. So was there any specific reason why you chose uh, the Air Force? Or was no, again, just I just random, just walked um, down the street. I think at that time in Dayton, Ohio, they had all the recruiters in one block. And so that was just the first door I went in. I started talking to the recruiter and told him that I wanted to join the military and he, you know, talked, gave his spiel, told me different things, but after I joined and learned about the other branches, I was glad I joined the Air Force. Very glad because I was a diva, still a diva, and Air Force lets me be a diva to a certain extent. You still can't wear big earrings like I like to wear, but you're still able to wear earrings nail polish, lipstick, so that was a great service for me. So what were those uh, what were those things that kind of, I guess, you know, made you feel that was the best decision compared to what you heard about the other branches? Well, it was more, it wasn't really like the military, it was more like a civilian job because you had a job, and my job was, at the time, it was called information management, which they changed it to administrative. So it was basically administrative work, so paperwork, and I grew up loving paperwork. Because my dad had his, her, his own business, my mom did the books, so she always taught me how to do the books. So I've always loved paperwork, and that was my job, because that's what I scored high, highest in when I took the test. But um, it was just like going to work 9 to 5 every day. There were times, of course, when you had to do um, exercises and sleep in the field, but that was also stuff I loved, because I was a tomboy. I was a tomboy for a number of years, and then my mom, she wasn't feeling it, because she's a diva, so she made me start wearing dresses. So I'm dual. I can either, I can, you know what I'm saying, take off my little high heels and play football with the guys, or I can put them back on, put my earrings on, lipstick, and act like a girl. Um, how long was your service? From what year to what year? So I signed up in 1968, and I retired in December of 2006. So I did 20 years, a few months, a few days. 1986, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I signed up in 1986 and then I retired in December of 2006. So you got my, got my date. This yes. yes. <laughs> um, what year did you leave for uh, basic training? I left in November of 1986 and I went to Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas for basic training. How did you get there? How did I get there? You to, what means of transportation? Plane. And that was the first time I'd ever been on a plane by myself. That was probably the first time I'd ever been out of Dayton, Ohio by myself. My family traveled a lot, but we traveled as a family. Because my father has five brothers and sisters, and so we always traveled together. And we've been in many places. So I was used to traveling. But in the cars? In cars. Okay. Well, I actually had a big old yellow bus that we traveled <laughs> in. But I was used to traveling, so when I went to the military, it just further, I further gave me what I love, which is to travel. What was going through your mind while you were on that plane? I really cannot tell you because I cannot remember that at all. I just remember being excited because I like adventure. I like things that are unknown that excites me. So I just remember being excited for this new adventure that I was taking in my life. I had no fear whatsoever 
but now that I look back, I'm like, why wasn't I scared? I don't understand why I wasn't scared, but I wasn't. I was so, looking forward to this new adventure in my life, so I imagine I was excited. What was your first experience once you, once you got the basic training? <sighs> my first experience was, I don't know why I did this, but before I left for basic training, I cut my hair really short because I thought it would be easier to take care of it. Not thinking I was not going to be allowed to curl my hair every day. So that was not a good move because so I looked like a chicken pretty much all the basic training because they wouldn't let you curl your hair. So that was not a good move. So all I was thinking was when we first got there, we were all in this big room and then they gave us the speech. What I remember is they said you had to pack up your makeup, your curling irons, all of your stuff you had to pack up and they were going to put it in a big storage room until you were done. And I was like tripping, tripping out about that. I was like, well, how am I supposed to curl my hair? Like, yeah, right. <laughs> you're in basic training, you're in the military. So I guess that's probably when it first hit me what I did. I mean, I wasn't um, regretful because that's what I wanted to do. But it first hit me as to what I did. I joined the military. And so from that point forward, I started having that mindset. Okay, I'm in the military. All my little girly ways and everything in high school and all of that is over and now I need to adapt to the environment that I'm in now. What was, uh, was there any culture shock? Once you got to this new area? Yes, there was. I have never in my life taken a shower with anyone else. And the first day we had to take showers is a big old room with a bunch of shower heads. And we were all supposed to take a shower together. And I was like, what? Never done that. And I'm not comfortable doing that. So for like the first two days, I would like mess around in my bag, pretend like I was looking for something until everybody was out. And then I ran in there and took a shower quick. But after two days, you were over that because you had like three minutes to shower. So it was like, okay, I'm over that. Uh, do you recall any of your instructors? Mm hmm I had a man and two females, but the man, his name was Sergeant Blanco. And I remember him vividly because he was very cute. Very cute. So, yes, that's his name. <laughs> now, what were they like? You know, they, one piece of advice that my recruiter gave me that saved me in basic training, I believe. He said it's all a game. He said they're going to be screaming the truth, they're going to be hollering the truth, they're going to be telling you to do this, that, and the other. You just do it, but don't get like, don't start crying, don't get mad because it's all a game. That's their job. Their job is to make you strong, you know, to make you military strong. So that piece of advice saved me when they were like up in my face screaming and hollering at me and I'm supposed to say yes sir and yes ma'am. So to the women I would say yes sir. And then they would holler at me, I'm not a sir. I'm like, yes, ma'am. So it was just, if he not had given me that advice, I might have started crying. I might have not been able to handle it. I might have, because this was a whole new experience for me. I'm away from my parents. We can't call them every day. We didn't have cell phones, of course. And if we did, we wouldn't be able to use them. So I was like on my own, having to grow up. This just turned 18 year old girl who's never been away from her parents, her family. So that was very, it was very rough, but again, he gave me that piece of advice, so I was able to survive that. Would you say that was the most difficult part of basic training? No, the most difficult part was actually the um, the running. I, because I was a tomboy, I aced the um, obstacle course. I mean, aced it. But running, it's not my forte. So I couldn't run. We had to run a mile and a half. I couldn't do it. And so when we had to qualify, I was called my parents because they let us make phone calls. And I was crying. I'm like, I'm not going to make it. I can't run. And so the day we had the test, two of my girlfriends saw me struggling. And so they both grabbed each one of my arms and they helped me pass the test. They helped me finish at the risk of them not passing. So that's when I realized that the military family is a family. They look out for you, they take care of you, they make sure that you don't fail. Did you receive any specialized training? Yes, after that I went to technical school in Biloxi, Mississippi, and that's where I learned my craft of information management, which was, again, administrative. So they taught you, I already knew how to type because of my mom, but um, they taught you how to type. Um, they taught you basically secretary skills at that time. Uh, when you enlisted, were you looking toward uh, doing more administrative work or were you looking for something a little more physical? I did not have any preconceived notions of anything. I just knew I joined the military and that was it. I didn't even know, honestly, I didn't even know whether I joined active duty or reserve. 
I had no clue. Because again, that time I was really shy, so I didn't ask questions. People just told me stuff and I just took it and then I was afraid to like ask questions, afraid to say anything. So I'm like, I didn't even know. And then they asked, they asked everybody, okay, who's active duty, who's reserved? They want the separators for whatever reason. And I really didn't know. I had to look at my card and they were like, okay, you're reserved. I'm like, okay, I'm reserved. But I, um, it was a good thing. Uh, the difference between active and... Uh, what's the, uh, what's, in your opinion, what's the difference between active and reserve? Well, the difference is active duty means you work at a military installation every day. So Monday through Friday, and sometimes they call for weekends, but mostly, like I said, a civilian job. Monday through Friday, you go to work from like nine to five or whatever your hours are, and then you go home, whether that be the barracks, you know, the dorms, or you have housing off base. Pretty much the dorms are housing off bases where, where that happens. And reserve, you go one week in a month and two weeks in the summer. So I did reserve because my plan was to already go to college. I was going to the University of Cincinnati, I had already been accepted. But I took a little detour when I joined the military. So I wanted to do the reserve because I wanted the military life, but I also wanted the college life. So to me, that was the best of both worlds. And it did end up being the best of both worlds because the money from the reserve paid for my car note. So I always had a car. I didn't have to worry about having a car. Not having a car. I always had a car. So that worked out perfect for me throughout college. So was that balance uh, manageable? Mm-hmm. It was very manageable. It's just that on the weekends when I had to go to reserve, my dad or my cousin would have to come and get me from school and take me back home because University of Cincinnati is an hour, 45 minutes to an hour from where I lived. So they would have to come and get me so I can go to work. Uh, how did you adapt to military life? Was there any big change you had to make? I adapted pretty easily because I was only in the reserve. Now, had I gone active duty straight, then I'm, it might have had a little few learning curves because you're doing that every day and you get stationed somewhere that may be, you know, thousands of miles from your parents, you know, from your family, from what you know. But for me, doing the reserve, I was able, after basic training test school, I was able to come back home and be in familiar territory. So for me, it wasn't really a learning curve except for the fact that in the beginning I got in trouble a lot because I'm very stubborn and I like to do what I like to do and I don't want to follow rules and so when it came to them putting me out and that's when I straightened my act up and I took it serious and I decided to become the best military person that I could be. So I would get in trouble for like you're not supposed to wear white socks, you're supposed to wear black. Well I couldn't find my black one day and I had to be at work so I wore white. So I got in trouble for that. Got in trouble for a little stuff because I didn't want to adhere to the rules, all of the rules. So then after that, I was like, okay, got to play by their rules. So what happened when you didn't play by the rules? You would get written up. And like, I, I'm not a morning person, so I was always late. And they were like, okay, if you're late one more time, you know, you're going to get written up. So then I would, get, I would be late the next day, and I would get written up. And then, like I said, when it got to the point where it was too much, they were like, okay, you know what? If you're late one more time, then it would get serious and more serious. And then, like I said, I was getting in trouble in so many different areas. It was just like, okay, you know what? You're risking being put out. I'm like, no, I don't want to be put out. I love it. So that's when I straight put up. I think at that time I was 19. So I had only been in a year, you know what I'm saying? It's just like growing pains, just like children growing up. They have to learn what's right, what's wrong, what you can do, what you can't. It's kind of what I was going through. So what do you have to have to, um do reserve duty and still going to school. Was there were there any tools that you learned um, while you were in the reserve that you got to take over with you to college? Um, most definitely, most definitely. You know, but what, like I said, the military teaches you to be a leader, and it teaches you to have discipline and structure, which is great for me because I was again hard headed and didn't like structure so much. And then my parents were not really strict because I was always independent, and I had my first job at fifteen. So I always worked in addition to having my fun. I always handled my business in addition to having my fun. So I didn't grow up in a strict environment and now I'm in a strict environment where there's structure and I have to, you know, abide by these rules and that. And you know, that was a little hard to adjust to, but having to adjust to that helped me with my discipline in college. So I knew that I had to study. But I mean I also I also had my fun 
but I knew that I had to study first and then have my fun. And if I didn't, then I couldn't have my fun for that day. So it gave me that structure that I needed being a freshman. And a lot of freshmen in college don't have that. You know what I'm saying? You know, the first year is usually party, 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 grades go, you know, go down, down, down. So for me, that helped me have that structure that I needed. Where did you serve? Where? Where all have I served? Well, I started at Wright Patterson Air Force Base in you Ohio. Said, you said like when, when each one. Hmm, I said when? you say when for each one. When? Yeah, for each one. Okay. Uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. I started in let's see, November. Basic training was six weeks, and tech school was six weeks. So let's say like January of 1987 is when I started at my unit with the 906 Civil Engineering Squadron. So I started there, and then I was at Wright Path for eight years. And then I moved to Atlanta in 94 and joined 94th Civil Engineer Squadron at Davis Air Reserve Base in Georgia. But in between times, I've traveled to, or I've worked um, many places. I've been to Germany, I think Panama was my first assignment, it was for two weeks, and it was when I was 19, and I absolutely loved it. I fell in love with the palm trees and the sun and the weather, and I just loved it, and I never wanted to leave, but of course I had to leave. And then I think Germany was next, and I've been to Germany twice, England, Spain, the Middle East, and several other places within the United States. I think I'm just backtracking just a little bit. Um, uh, back to you adapting to the military life, how was the, um, phys the physical regimen, the social life, the food? Yeah. Um, during basic training in tech school or after? Um, Let's just well, say during, it was, during basic training it was very scary because you went to the chow hall and they had this table they called the snake pit and that's where like all of the, the um, training instructors, they call them TIs, all of the training instructors sat and you have to like carry yourself in a manner that they told you. Like you have to walk a certain way, carry your tray a certain way, sit down a certain way. So it was always scary going to eat because you never knew when you were going to mess up and they were looking at you. And then like the first time, maybe the first week, I couldn't even eat because I was just so scared that I would do something wrong. But then you get used to it and then it becomes normal. And then there were times where you can't even talk at the table, so you just eat. I wasn't used to that, you know, I grew up in a family and we ate at the table always. That was my parents' rule. We always ate every meal at the table. So we're used to talking and bantering, and, but there, there was like no talking. And then you'll try to whisper and then they were holler, no talking! So it was just very scary to eat. And then um, tech school, they lighten up a little bit more. You go to the child hall, you can eat, you can talk, you can wear civilian clothes. And then when I got stationed at my base, it was no rules in terms of that. So you went to eat with your friends, you eat on base or off base. So off base, of course, was free. So that food was always better because it was free, but of course off base you would have to pay. But sometimes you didn't want to eat on base, you want to eat off base. But eating on base was great because they had a variety of food, I mean, variety of food that you could choose from. So. Uh, how was the social life? Excellent, excellent. Like I said, you grew up like a family, so there were cliques and everybody formed their little cliques, but I'm a very social person, you know, especially now that I've grown out of all that shyness. But um, even then, people always were drawn to me. So I wasn't shy within my group of friends. I was just shy in front of a group of people I didn't know. So I, I developed my group of friends and you were extremely tight. I mean, you did everything together. And now that I'm out the military, that's one of the main things that I miss. I don't have that family anymore. You know, I'm used to you get off work and we go eat or we go party or we go, but we're always together. And that's what I miss, that camaraderie. And that's what you get in the military and it's very strong. They are always looking out for you. And like when we go somewhere overseas, you know, the male guys, they're always looking out for you to make sure that you don't want to cross anybody in these foreign countries who's going to you know, harm you or do anything bad. So that's what I loved. Um, Before you move on, I want to add, interject and ask a question about the the socializing in the group. That, so you said, so how did you all pick each other, or what? What it's what's just some weird. Of, some it's, of the story. <laughs> I'm trying to think because when I first started at Wright Pad, of course I was young, 
So people automatically took to me because here I'm this 18 year old. And they were older because they had been in, they're never older, they had been in longer so they knew the ropes. So it usually started, when well, the beginning just started with people trying to help me. Mm -hmm. like big sister. Yes, kind exactly. Of mm -hmm. Big brothers. Big Helped sister. me acclimate myself to the military. And when I was doing something wrong, they would tell me, you don't need to do that because it's against the rules or this, that, and the other. And um, so that's how it really started. But then, of course, like at Wright Pat, you also meet friends outside of your core group of friends and other um, departments or other branches because of, you might have to work with them. So sometimes, like in my job, I may have to work with the main office who does the um, performance evaluations and stuff like that. And then you become friends like that. Uh, have you stayed in touch with any of these people? Well, the people that I was um, in the military with at this last assignment at Dobbins, yes, every year we get together um, in November for Veterans Day and we go eat. So that's how we stay together. But still, for me, it's not enough. Like, I want to be able to have that environment because my last assignment, and let me mention that as a reservist, you can do active duty at any time. So I've done a lot of active duty time. And my last assignment was at Dobbins um, at one of the schools we had for civil engineers. It was like two and a half years I was on active duty, and I always planned parties. So I would plan a party to go to the Fernbeck Museum. If I were planning a party to go to the NCO club on base, and it was just like everybody came. So like students who were here, I was like, hey, we're going to such and such, and they would come. It was just so much fun, just so much easy fun. No fighting, no none, none of that. It was just everybody got along and it was fun. What are some of your favorite memories of serving abroad? Hmm, like I already told you, I love Panama because of the scenery. Like I love palm trees and being from Dayton, Ohio, really didn't see palm trees. And like I said, my family, we've traveled a lot and I've seen palm trees here and there, but there were so many palm trees and I was just like, this is like the best place ever. And it was just so relaxing and so serene. The weather was beautiful at night. So that was a memory that I will always carry with me. Um, there were also a lot of bridges, which at the time I'm, I'm still a little scared of bridges, but I was really scared of bridges then. So we had to go over a bridge to go to work. So that was like pretty scary. But um, what else did I love? I don't really care for Germany and England because I don't do cold. I'm a sunny girl, so that wasn't very exciting for me. But you're from Ohio. I know, that's what everybody say. You're from Ohio. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm not a, a winter girl. Maybe that's why I like summer because I grew up in all that snow and blizzards, and I just love the sun and the palm trees and pretty. So Panama, again, was my favorite. I actually did like the Middle East. I went to Qatar, which I think they pronounce it Qatar. It's Q-A-T-A-R. I went there um, the year I retired, May of 2006 to September, and I actually did like it there because the city, like when you go into the city, was beautiful. You don't see that on TV. You just see like war-torn environment saying, but it was beautiful. Their shopping mall was five levels and it was all glass. I mean, it was just, the water was crystal clear. It was just beautiful, so I loved it there. I mean, I didn't like the, the sandstorms. Those were not fun. But, and the heat in August was absolutely ridiculous. I mean, the concrete was so hot, you could barely walk. But other than that, Ooh, I liked temperatures. It. Girl, 118 <sighs> dry heat. So I guess it's supposed to be like California, but I think it was worse. It was so hot. Oh my goodness. And I have a, um, just a follow up question. So the traveling and so still kind of help us understand the difference between active, you were saying you're, you're on reserve duty mm -hmm. and you're going in once a month and then two weeks in the summer. In the summer. But, they but always then you can go to yeah. active duty at yeah. any time. So kind of Yes, because they always that. had jobs available. So it was just like they always needed, like whatever your rank was in your job, that was your rank in your job. Like if your job was administrative, you could go anywhere around the world and do that job. Certain things may be different, but the core is still the same. So um, I became friends with a lady who was over the, all the admins on base. 
And so she knew I liked to travel and she knew I, sometimes I had availability to do different things. So she would call me and say, oh, I got an assignment to such and such. Do you want it? I'm like, yes, I want it. Or if I can, then I'm like, no, man, I can't do it. And so um, my last year, I wanted to get in a couple of trips because my goal for my whole military career was to make it to Japan because I just wanted to go there. Just seeing everybody who went to Japan, Okinawa, they came back and said it was absolutely wonderful. So I'm like, I want to go, I want to go. Never got there. So my last year, they had jobs available and I pulled up the list and I'm like, okay, I want to go to Japan. I want to go to Italy. I want to go to the Middle East. That would send me out with a bang. And then Italy got canceled, Japan got canceled, and I ended up going to the Middle East for four months. So Italy and Japan were the two most ones, because I missed the Italy trip because I didn't go. And they came back, and they were like, oh, my God, you missed it. And I'm like, oh. So maybe one day I'll still make it to Japan and Italy. One day. And so the, being there four months, you're then keeping active the paper, duty. active duty, but mm -hmm. keeping the paperwork. Yeah, I was um, well, I was a master sergeant when I retired, and so I rose through the ranks pretty steadily because of my mom. My mom is very organized, very detailed, so she taught me to be that way in the way I worked in the administrative field, so because of that, my bosses always loved me, and so I pretty much rose through the ranks pretty quickly. So um, in the military, once you become a sergeant, you're pretty much a supervisor. So like I said, they trained you early on to be a leader. And I think I became a sergeant, I was 22. So I was young, and I'm a supervisor over people. And so by the time I retired, I was a master sergeant, which is an E7. So I had two more to go for the top. So I was a master sergeant, then a senior master sergeant, then as chief master sergeant, and that's the top of the enlisted ranks. So I was pretty high up. But when you're, again, when you're a master sergeant, you're automatically a supervisor. So. I didn't really want to be a supervisor when I went up to the Middle East because I just wanted to go over there, do my job, not have to deal with the stresses of supervising people and staff, but I was. So I had to manage two administrative people and two computer people. They were part of my section. Mm -hmm. And being in the Middle East, never been there before, you don't have resources like you do in America. So when I had to plan a commander's, um, what they call? It was where the old commander was leaving and the new commander was coming in. So I had to plan that event. Mm -hmm. And that was very difficult having minimal resources. But um, again, the way I've been trained, I was able to pull it off with no problem. And so um, I did things like that. And then the group of people who were there when I arrived, it was time for them to go home. And in order for them to go home, you have to print tickets. So it's not like going to Delta to get tickets. It's the whole military program that you have to utilize and it's secure. So people can't find out that these people are coming home and do something to the plane or whatever. And I had no clue how to do that, not one. But I asked questions. I'm good at figuring stuff out. I figured out and I got them home. And so the guy who was over that group was like, oh my God, I can't believe you did it. So it was just, I love the military because I like to work. I like to work hard and I like to know that I'm doing a good job. And it's evident when you're in the military, when you're doing something. And you know, I had to send 250 people home and I got them all home safely. So that was just like, okay, okay, did that, next. And it was so many next, it was like ridiculous. So just having to do like big, cause I'm, so if you're working and you're doing administration um, and you also mentioned about maybe issues you know, of people mm -hmm. issues yeah, people. of, of yeah, office. I had a lot of office. Yes, I had a lot of share, share a story with us. Well, um, when I'm working, I'm very serious. I believe when you work, it's, when you're at work, it's time to work. When we off work, we can play, but don't play all my time. I don't like that. And I am, again, I'm not as shy as I used to be, so I speak my mind now. And so, of course, my employees didn't like me for that. But I'm just like, okay, this is the job. You've been in long enough where you know to come to, come to work and do the job, not play around. They would show up late. One girl, because we had to work seven days a week, 10 hour, 12 hours a day. And so my night employees, I wouldn't even see them. Because when we switch shifts, they come in, I wouldn't see them. And the one girl wasn't even coming into work for like six hours. And I didn't know, of course. And so it was just like, really? Come on now. So dealing with that was just, I didn't want that on my last tour. I didn't want that stress. I didn't want to have to deal with writing people up. And I was writing them up so much, I got tired of it. I said, forget it. 
forever. <laughs> this, oh, um, photos. Do you have photos of all these places you travel? You know what? I am a big picture taker, and I've had photos of all of it. Mm -hmm. But um, in one of my apartments a few years ago, I um, had everything in a container, and I put it outside on my deck. On my deck, the roof wasn't really one piece. It was pieces of you know wood, boards. And so the rain got to it and ruined all of my pictures. Mm -hmm. I was so upset. I'm still upset, but what can I do about it? Nothing. So I still have some pictures, mm -hmm. but the rest of them are up here. Um, do you, can you uh, recall anyone specifically that you formed a bond with? Um, yes, but there wasn't any one. Like I said, I'm very sociable, so I'm friends with everyone. You know, you had your cliques, but I was friends with all of the cliques. And then, of course, my clique didn't really like the fact I was friends with all the cliques. But I'm like, I don't care. I don't see cliques. I don't see different races of people or different nationalities. I just see people. And so I was friends with everyone. But my clique consisted of um, quite a few people. As a matter of fact, all of the women, you know, there are not many women in the military. So in my unit, we had maybe nine women. So only like two or three of them were not in my clique. So actually, we called ourselves, we formed a little group, and we called ourselves the CE Sisterhood. And actually, our picture is right there. So we actually took a picture so that we can always, and we all have a picture framed so that we can always remember our CE Sisterhood. But that was pretty much the female clique. And then, you know, you have the guys who were always um, with us as well. So we would always go to lunch together. And CE is civil, civil engineering. engineering. Yes, okay. civil engineering. And civil engineering consisted of, um, we had engineers, we had me, of course, admin. And then I was also, part of my career, I went back to school 